sec. We are live. Everybody, a few minutes to settle in. <clears throat> well, good morning. Thanks for joining us for worship here on this beautiful Lord's Day, uh, third Lord's Day in May already. Kind of hard to believe we're that far into the year. Uh, but uh, no, no renouncements at this time uh, to speak of, but if I can ask you, if you're able to do so, if you can stand for our call to worship. Our call to worship is Psalm number 48. 48, it says, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king, Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them their anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind, you shattered the ships of Tarshish, as we have heard, so we have seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever, Selah. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about in Zion. Go around her, number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God. Our God forever and ever, he will guide us forever. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our worship this morning. O Lord, our Lord, Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. And as is your name, O Lord, uh, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth, Lord. From the rising of the sun to its setting, your name is to be praised, Lord. We ask this morning that you would work in us by your spirit what is pleasing in your sight, that we might worship you with reverence and awe. Move us to worship you in, in spirit and in truth. May you be greatly pleased and glorified in our worship today. For we ask all these things in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, our first hymn this morning from the Trinity Psalter hymnal. It's a, a hymn that's based upon our, our call to worship. It's number 524. That's 524, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, and uh, remain standing if you can do so. Trinity Psalter 
Exodus still, and we are up to Exodus chapter 22, so if you have a Bible, if you want to turn to that chapter, we're going to read the whole chapter there this morning. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so if you don't have uh, the ESV and you're reading a different translation, it might read a little differently, but in substance it'll be the same. We'll give ear to the reading of God's holy word this morning. Exodus 22, it says, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay uh, five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun has risen on him, there shall be blood guilt for him. He shall surely pay. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the stolen beast is found alive in his possession, whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over and lets his beast loose and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution uh, from the best in his own field and in his own vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches uh, in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain of the field or the field is consumed, he who started the fire shall make full restitution. If a man gives to his neighbor money or goods to keep safe and it is stolen from the man's house, then if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, the owner of the house shall come near to God to show whether or not he has put his hand on his neighbor's property. For every breach of trust, whether it is for an ox, for a donkey, for a sheep, for a cloak, or for any kind of lost thing of which one says, this is it, uh, the case of both parties shall come before God. The one whom God condemns shall pay double uh, for his, to his neighbor. If a man gives to his neighbor a donkey or an ox or a sheep or any beast to keep safe, and it dies or is injured or is driven away without anyone seeing it, an oath by the Lord shall be between them both to see whether or not he has put his hand on his neighbor's property. The owner shall accept the oath and he shall not make restitution. But if it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. If it is torn by beasts, let him bring it, it as evidence. Uh, he shall not make restitution for what has been torn. If a man borrows anything of his neighbor's and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, he shall make full restitution. If the owner was with it, he shall not make restitution. If it was hired, it came for its hiring fee. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. He shall not <clears throat> permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows, and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people with uh, you who are as poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for it is only, uh, for it is his only covering, uh, and it is his cloak for his body, and what else uh, shall he sleep? And if he cries out to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. You shall be consecrated to me. Therefore you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. This ends the reading of God's word. Well, again, up until chapter 21 in the book of Exodus, I think most of it reads pretty straightforward to our to our eyes and ears, uh, the, the story of the Exodus, God's redeeming his people from slavery in the land of Egypt, the house of slavery. Chapter 20 gives the Ten Commandments, and then chapter 21, through, through the end of the book, really, uh, 
Most of it is involving uh, these civil laws, these judicial laws. Uh, other, other things are instructions for the tabernacle, for the, sacri the sacri different sacrifices and whatnot, the ceremonial aspects of the law, the civil or judicial aspects of the law. And these are the things that we sometimes can have difficulty understanding uh, rightly. Uh, looking again at verse, um, verse 2. This is just a personal anecdote when it says, If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun is risen on him, there shall be blood guilt for him, for he shall surely pay. I, I once heard a sermon on this text, and I, I applaud the pastor who gave the sermon for at least preaching the Old Testament, which so many fail to do in our day. I don't know why, but, it, it, you know. And he preached on a text that many would never touch. Uh, you know, a lot of people would go through Exodus, I think, Get to chapter 20 and they'd change gears and go somewhere else. He, he was faithful enough to stick with the text and go right through it. But I distinctly remember leaving the church, walking out to the parking lot with friends of mine about my age. And I looked at them and they looked at me and I said, was the point of that sermon that if somebody breaks into your house, you can kill them? If it's at night? And that was the only application given in the sermon. Like The sermon was basically just expounding, faithful to the text, so to speak. I mean... It, you know, that's what it says, but there was no Christ in the sermon, there was no, uh, and granted, I'm not saying it's easy to, to do all these things, but um, I, I found that to be rather discouraging at the time. I was happy that he was going through Exodus, but uh, to make that the only application. Now, one, one of the things about these, these chapters after Exodus 20 is, Exodus 20 gives us the Ten Commandments, the first 17 verses, which is a summary of God's moral law. Well, left in the abstract, you know, it's, 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 you know, we're not left to ourselves, basically, because of these chapters to kind of decide how these things apply in real life. And so what you have in the civil laws or the judicial laws of Israel is you have, in, to their context, here's how the Ten Commandments, both tables of the law, frankly, here's how they applied to the, to the nation state of Israel as God's people. You know, the, the church in, in the Old Testament in Israel was a was a we would think of it as an odd duck. You know, we, we hear the word theocracy in our day and it's it's tossed around as a scare word, you know, they were a theocracy. We don't want a theocracy. Well um, well they they literally were a theocracy and so uh, the civil laws punish not only offenses against the second half, the second table of the law, but the first half as well. You know, don't let a sorceress live. Things like that that we look at and, you know and, and we shake our heads. The previous chapter, I'm sure there were things in chapter 21, as I read that last Sunday, maybe some of you were at home and, and kind of squirming in your seats a little bit and uncomfortable and not sure how that would apply. You know, there are many unbelievers and skeptics and scoffers who would mock these things and say, oh, you know, well, do you still stone children who curse their parents? And, you know, if you really believe God's law, that's what you should do. And, and to that, I would say, one, that's a misunderstanding of how that law would apply uh, to us today. But to say there's no application of God's civil law today is... I think, a, a, a silly, unbiblical idea. There's wisdom in how to apply it, uh, but before we're so quick to mock uh, the Old Testament civil law, uh, I would say, you know, who are we to talk? I, I would say if we're going to complain about uh, civil laws, judicial laws being, you know, uh, un, un, improper or unjust in the Old Testament, which they aren't, uh, and they weren't, uh, we should look in the mirror at our own judicial system, our own civil laws, and see if we don't have some uh, blood on our hands. You know, we have a, a, a government whose laws and whose policies uh, pays hundreds of millions of dollars every year to Planned Parenthood. And what do they do for a living? They kill babies in the womb. That's just. That shouldn't be mocked. That shouldn't be ridiculed. That should be really, it shouldn't be. There's nothing just about that. We have... Uh, even in recent days, I've read reports and, and news reports of, of people being let, you know, murderers, violent criminals being let out of prison over fears of the, the uh, coronavirus. And they've gone out, and it's like the first thing they did within a day was murder someone. So the safety of the people on the outside don't matter, doesn't matter. But the, the criminals, are, the people that did something they shouldn't have done matters. And notice one other thing in our text, and I'll stop with this. And I didn't count them, but I highlighted them. How many times did you hear something in the, in the chapter about making restitution? There's a totally different way of looking at criminal uh, justice in, in the Old Testament. And I have to say, when I read this chapter, I thought, 
That's a better system. Victims actually get some kind of restitution for the crime being done, whereas in our day, you know, I, I can't help but, but think that in some ways, uh, this rehabilitative idea of, of punishing the criminal that way doesn't help anybody. It doesn't rehabilitate, in most cases, the criminal, and it certainly does nothing for the victim. In many cases, the victim is almost irrelevant, it seems like, the way things are done. But, so all that to say is, you know, before we're going to start casting stones, so to speak, at the Old Testament civil law, maybe we should take a look at our own systems and see what, uh, where we could do better in being more like what it's, it's written here. But um, the civil law, again, we said last week, uh, the Westminster Confession talks about uh, general equity, that it, it applies only by general equity. We don't take these laws and, and superimpose them as, our, as they're written into our own civil law because we are not Israel, but at the same time, it, it does apply. And where there are principles, they should apply. I think the principle of restitution certainly applies. I think all these things have application if we have the wisdom to, uh, to look into them. But uh, one other thing, one other verse that came to mind when I was reading this, it says uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, um, talking about the commandments and God's laws, it says uh, in verse, uh, what is it, verse 6, it says, keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, the nations, the Gentiles, right? Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? God's law is a good thing. God's law is holy and just and we still should have great appreciation for it and apply it as, uh, as, as proper in, in our own context. But let's pray as we've read God's law. Uh, let's go to our prayer of adoration and confession. We praise God for his goodness, even for his law. And we confess our sins, how we've transgressed his law in so many ways, and ask for his forgiveness and thankfully receive his forgiveness. What a privilege we have to know the Lord in whom there's abundant forgiveness and redemption. Let's, let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we give you praise this morning on this day that you have made, that we can rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, we give you praise and honor and glory. We wish we could give you the praise and honor and glory that you deserve. We can't even come close to that, we know. And thank you that by your grace, uh, those of us who are in Christ Jesus one day in heaven, will give you more and more uh, closely of the praise that you deserve, that you so greatly deserve for your perfections for your goodness toward us, for your mighty deeds on behalf of your people, for your work of salvation uh, of your people in Christ, and by sending your Son to die for our sins, uh, to take the judgment that we deserved, and he took that in our place, raising him from the dead on the third day, and for sending your Spirit to, to work, uh, to give us new life in him, to work faith and repentance in all who believe, to unite us to Christ by faith, to impart to us all the gifts that Christ pours out, uh, through his spirit uh, to his people and to his church. Lord, we, we praise you and thank you for that. Thank you for your goodness, your kindness. Thank you for your law, Lord. We give you praise even for your law. Who is like the Lord our God, whose laws, whose statutes are so just and righteous and holy and to be uh, applied even, even in our day in a way uh, that there's much that we can learn even for our own government, our own laws, our own system from your law. And we thank you for that. We thank you that so many of our laws are based in some way upon your moral law as expressed in the Ten Commandments and elsewhere as well, Lord. You are righteous and holy and just and infinitely so. You are holy, 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 and you would have us who are called by you, by your grace in Christ, to, to be holy as you are holy. And so, Lord, we ask that you would uh, work in us what's pleasing in your sight. We ask that you would forgive us for our sins, Lord. We know that when we read your commandments, even your statutes and the civil law, sometimes we read them, and if we have any sense, we see that we are guilty in so many ways of transgressing your laws, your commandments, your will for our lives, and in what we think, that we have all thought things, even in the past day and in the past week that have been displeasing to you. We have not loved you with all of our mind and all of our heart and soul and strength. We have uh, thought things of others that maybe we haven't said with our lips, but we've thought things that were... Uh, hateful towards other people. We have been angry in an unjust way. We have been jealous and covetousness of others. Forgive us for these things, Lord. Forgive us for our sins.
of thought. Forgive us for our sins of word, Lord. We've all said things that we should not say. We have spoken evil of others and praised you with the same mouth and your word says that should not be so. Lord, we have grumbled and complained about our circumstances when we have, uh, of all people on this earth, reason to be thankful uh, and reason to praise you and reasons not to grumble. You call us to thanksgiving and thankfulness for a good reason, Lord. Forgive us for grumbling. Forgive us for complaining. And Lord, forgive us for the things we've done that we should not have done, the ways we have transgressed your commandments in our actions, uh, as well as the things we've left undone, the sins of omission that we have failed to do your will in so many things, Lord. We ask that you would forgive us for our sins, which are many. Forgive us for our sins that, uh, Lord, we don't even know half the number of them. We don't know and appreciate the depth of them. But, uh, Lord, we thank you that in you there is abundant redemption that, so that you might be feared that you promise us in your word that if we confess our sins, you, Lord, are faithful and you are just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. And so we thank you for that, Lord. And we ask that you would work in us by your spirit, that you would uh, deliver us from evil, that you would keep us from the way of temptation, that we might not sin against you. And, and work in us, change our hearts, help us to repent of our sins and to work to walk more and more in newness of life and the power of Christ's resurrection. And Lord, we pray for our nation having read even part of the civil law here this morning from Exodus 22. Lord, we pray that you might uh, grant in your mercy, that you might have mercy upon our land, that you might grant repentance and faith in Christ to many, that you would turn many of our elected officials, whether governors or mayors or council people or the president himself or anyone else who doesn't know you, we don't know their condition, Lord, before you, but uh, any of them who don't know you or are still in their sins, Lord, we ask that you would have mercy upon them, that you would turn them from their sin, turn them back to you and save them from their sins. And we ask even more so on top of that, Lord, that you might work in them, that they might have uh, your righteousness in mind and how they govern, that they would be mindful of, of uh, that they answer to you and how they lead and how they govern and what they decide. And Lord, we pray that you would Heal our land. Forgive our sins, which are many. Even we talked about the sin of abortion this morning. Lord, we ask that you would heal our land. Turn us from this wicked thing. We pray that it would no longer be legal, that it would no longer be financed by our government, by taxpayer dollars, that it would be shunned, and that life would be celebrated, that marriage would be upheld as honorable among all, that you would restore fathers to their children, and uh, that uh, you would just turn our land back to you. Heal us. Forgive our sins and heal our land, for it's in Christ's name that we ask all these things. Amen. For our next two uh, songs, you can remain <coughs> seated for. Our next song is number 452, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Again, Trinity Psalter Hymnal, number 452, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Mm -hmm. 
singing them. You're singing a lot of gospel to yourself, and I hope we can all take that to heart. Our next song is number 539, 539, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? <laughs> So uh, I do want to thank you all for uh, being faithful to mailing in and dropping off and whatnot your, your tithes and contributions. Thank you for that. God is good and has provided. So let's praise him and thank him by singing the doxology this morning. Number 567, the doxology. out there. We uh, certainly appreciate those of you who are tuned in and just pray that the Lord is uh, providing your spiritual needs through this on this beautiful Lord's Day. Everything changes here in the uh, hardware. I got R2-D2 <laughs> up here now to distract me, but uh, hopefully I'm going to fight against that. Anyway, um, some weeks ago I was speaking on a couple of texts before we went to prayer about certain experiences I had back in the day when uh, I was involved in an open air ministry. And uh, uh, the blessing of seeing uh, folks brought to Christ through that. Um, and I, since then, I've been thinking about past experiences I've had and such, um, and thinking about the plight of the unsaved and thinking about the reactions of those who we sought to give the gospel to, not only in that setting, but we also, I was involved in a door-to-door -door evangelism uh, effort for, oh, probably 20-some years, and we'd go knocking on doors and seeking to give the, the gospel to as many as we could. Um, and I, I remember the attitudes of the unsaved many times and how clever they thought they were and all the rebuttals that they would seek to throw at you and, uh, uh, and remembering that as an unsaved person I did the same thing and that uh, many of the rebuttals and the, the clever little arguments that I had as an unbeliever to try to uh, discredit the gospel 
uh, were being repeated by them. And there's, as, as Solomon might say, there's nothing new under the sun. And I, I was thinking of one uh, rebuttal that I received personally from my best friends that were my best friends before the Lord saved my soul. And uh, they said many things to me after the Lord saved my soul, which I won't repeat. But one of the, one of the things they did say is, is that uh, this Jesus is your crutch. And as a, uh, and this is all leading up to prayer, by the way. <laughs> but uh, I remember as a young believer scrambling to try to defend myself, uh, defend the gospel, defend the Lord Jesus, who needs no defense. He's his own defense. <laughs> but I, I remember trying to rebut that accusation that Jesus was my crutch. Well... Some years into my Christian experience, I began to realize that Jesus is my crutch in a good way, in a positive way. And it, it brought to, to, just thinking about that lately, um, I thought of a couple of the texts that Pastor Andy's been preaching on in, this, in the different series these past uh, weeks and months. He touched on the uh, book of Joel, where we read about the great and terrible day of the Lord coming. And who shall be able to endure, it says in the text. And this is an Old Testament uh, equivalent to what he also preached on uh, many, many weeks ago in the book of Revelation about not only the temporal judgments of God coming from time to time called the day of the Lord, but that final day of the Lord. We just, we just sung about it, if you, if you were paying attention, as Pastor said to, <laughs> to what you're singing as the past couple of hymns we sang touch on that, which was not planned, but I thought of um, the fact that Jesus is my crutch. Jesus is my support. Jesus is the only one in which I can stand in that final terrible day. Uh, and it's not terrible to me or to you if you're born again because of that. And so my whole defense at uh, somewhere along the line in my Christian experience when people would hit me with that oh you know Jesus is your crutch I would no longer try to uh, say well no he's not I, I would take you, you ever want to take the wind out of an unsaved person's sails that says something like that turn it back on them and I don't mean this in a bad way I mean it for the good of their soul and like in this case it said well I can remember saying you're absolutely right. When they said, Jesus is my crutch. You're absolutely right. And I would take them, uh, in most cases, hopefully, to uh, Revelation chapter 6. And if you got a Bible there, please turn to that out there in Cyberland. And the last verse in the chapter says, For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Speaking of the final judgment day. And it's a rhetorical question to God's people because they know who shall be able to stand. They know the answer to that. If you're born again, you know from the scriptures the answer to that. But look at, real quickly, look at the verses that precede this. It's horrific. It's horrific because even till the final moment of life many unbelievers will remain unbelievers and spend their last moments trying to hide from God and, and this struck me again lately as I was thinking about this if uh, you back up just a little bit where it tells us uh, and you can read even prior to this um, but I'll pick up at 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the, in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Have you ever 
been to Carlsbad Caverns or somewhere like that. And I, I can remember standing in Carlsbad Caverns under countless tonnage of rock and remembering this and thinking about the plight of the unsaved, how that they would rather than repent, they would rather call upon all of that to collapse on them if it would only hide them from God and God's righteous judgment. What a, a fearful thing. They didn't have the crutch. They didn't have the one who would enable them to stand in that final day. But then there could be no greater contrast than to you and me who claim the Lord Jesus in that same day if you look at the next chapter, uh, and just for the sake of starting, uh, in verse 9, there was a beheld in a great multitude which no man could number of all the nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne, see the same throne, and before the Lamb, it's the same Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, salvation, see they're not crying for the rocks to fall on them, they're crying, they're worshiping, salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces, faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever one of the, angel, the elders answered and said to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Who shall be able to stand those who are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Those are they who be, will be able to stand in that great day of his wrath. And if that means that that is my crutch, amen, so be it. I'm glad for it. So these are just meandering thoughts of mine during the week, which you have to put up with at the beginning of the next week whenever I up here leading in prayer um, but I hope they're edifying I hope that these things come to your mind as well and if you are not convinced in your mind and your heart that you have the righteousness of Christ accredited to you uh, don't be as those who cried for the rocks to fall on them in that day for that day could be today for all we know we don't know even the Apostle Paul thought it was imminent. He didn't know. He had no idea. And if he didn't know, nobody but God himself knows. But it isn't the point as to when that's going to happen. The point is, are you prepared? Are you ready? Will you cry to the rocks to fall on you? Or will you be busy worshiping God at, his, at the coming of Jesus Christ and of the Lamb? So we'll go to prayer at this time. This is the prayer of uh, thanksgiving and supplication. Now, of course, it's hard to not overlap all the things about uh, the first part of the praying that Andy's done, this part, but uh, that is to be the emphasis, and as always, we have so much to be thankful for. As always, we have so much to ask for, and uh, it's good that we do it in that order, I think. Remembering the blessings of the past and of the present before we go to God and ask him for blessings in the future. I want to pray for those who are not uh, even with us here this morning that normally are. Some are traveling. My wife Linda is back uh, helping out her mom, which many of you know, uh, Pauline, uh, who is moving. She's going to be 91 in a couple weeks, and she's moving from uh, New Mexico to uh, Nebraska to live near another one of uh, Linda's sisters uh, and also we have a last minute glitch of that trip of Linda back there finding out that a uh, 
uh, sister-in-law of ours who lives there as well in New Mexico has just been diagnosed with uh, uh, very aggressive cancer and may not have uh, long to live. I want to pray for that situation. Pray for our brother-in-law, Doug, who also has been diagnosed with cancer, going uh, through some treatment there. Uh, praying for Bill and Mona. Bill is seemingly getting stronger, and we sure, certainly would hope that he'd be able to come home finally and uh, be at home, uh, especially the way things are now when you can't even go visit folks. I mean, what a heart-wrenching thing to not be able to be permitted to visit your loved one who is in the hospital. It's like, come on, that's awful. I can't imagine that. Um, you know, that, that tugs at my heart, just like this tugs at my heart that we can't worship together yet as we would wish. And we certainly are going to pray for that too, that that would be restored and sooner rather than later. So much to pray about, and I'll be quiet as far as my comments and go to prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triune God. We, we just sang about you as the triune God in our, our uh, singing earlier in the service. Um, we, we, we thank you, Lord, that you are the creator, sustainer, and coming judge of everyone that we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ, as the Apostle said. And Lord, we just thank you, those of us who trust in you by your grace, working in us to trust in you. We thank you for that. We thank you that we have the blessed hope. We have uh, the hope of, of eternal fellowship with you to come, that we have fellowship with you now, and we have fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ now, but compared to what is yet to come, it's almost as nothing to, to be compared to the glory that waits, to the glory of those that were pictured in this uh, reading this morning as being clothed in the righteousness of Christ, uh, worshiping before the throne. Uh, we, we, we really don't have a clue as to how blessed and wonderful that's going to be. But we do thank you, as this is the prayer of thanksgiving, we thank you most of all that we are not any longer seeking to hide from you. For who can hide from you? You're, in the Psalms it talks about going up into heaven and you are there, descending into the deepest hell and you are there. There's nowhere that we can hide from the om omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient God. And Lord... Uh, we, when we were in our unsaved state, uh, thought we could hide from you. We did whatever we could to hide from you. We did whatever we could to ignore you. We perhaps in many ways, by our living and in our sins, shook our fists at you. And yet, Lord, in your infinite love and uh, kindness, came to us and gave us the gift of faith, gave us the gift of repentance and brought drew us to your son lord uh, this is the greatest of things the greatest of gifts and for this we thank you and all our thanks for anything else just flows from that all our thanks for anything that we receive in this present life flows from that for that is the greatest of gifts and lord you bestow so many gifts upon upon us uh, in the, even in this present life we are, at on our worst day, a people most blessed. We thank you for everything we have. We thank you for our families. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for our jobs. I would thank you and praise you for uh, giving a new job to our sister Marilyn this week, uh, who faithfully comes and plays the piano and sings for us these worship services thank you for blessing her thank you for blessing all of us who still are able to work that we are able to provide for ourselves provide for our families and provide for the furtherance of your gospel in your local church here I pray for all of our brothers and sisters who normally would would uh, be gathered with us here in this place who are at home watching this service at this time 
I pray, Lord, that you would meet their every need, spiritually, emotionally, temporally, financially, and in every way. And give them faith, new renewed faith, strengthened faith. Give them patience. Give me patience. Give us patience. And that you would be pleased to restore the gathered church in our community and all churches that uphold your gospel. We pray for our land, Lord. Our land is filled with great confusion. Our land is filled with great sins. Pastor Andy in his previous prayer touched on some of those, the, the sins of murdering children in the womb, the, the prolification of the sexual deviancy and immorality. It just you often think how you laid waste the cities of the plain in the Old Testament and turned them to ash for such sins and probably less sins than are, are happening even this, at this present time in our own land. A land that was so rich in its heritage, so rich in being established on godly principles. Uh, Lord, we just pray as Abraham prayed for Sodom and for Gomorrah that you would spare it just as he prayed you would spare those cities for the sake of your people within them. And Lord, in their cases, there were not enough people that were born again to spare the place. But Lord, we just pray for the sake of your church in this land that you would spare it, you would give repentance to it, you would deal with the leaders of it and convert them or remove them. And Lord, we, we remember what we just read, that the, even the mighty men, the chief captains and all in authority, and it lists everybody all the way down to slaves in their day, uh, hid themselves and cried for the rocks to fall on them. Lord, even for those who seem to hate you, who are in government and such, we pray for them. We pray for, that you would change their hearts. We pray that you give them repentance. We don't wish for them to be in that day crying for the rocks to fall on them. We wish, Lord, for every soul we encounter that they might be born again. Oh, Lord, how we pray for that. We pray that this land would have a new face, not a face, as Andy's mentioned, of a theocracy, but a face of, the, of a nation whose leaders uh, would love your law, love your truth, love you, and that would filter on down through the populace. Lord, even your word tells us that happy is the nation whose uh, God is the God of the, of the Bible, as I would paraphrase it anyway, who's ruled by those who are, are godly instead of those who are not. Lord, uh, I pray for those who are not with us today in travel, for Linda, for Bob and Peggy Groves, who are so faithful at attending here and, and putting their arms, their shoulders to the plow, so to speak. I pray for these that you would return them to us safely uh, and bless them on their way, that they'd have journeying mercies to return to us. We pray, I pray for any who, of our number who may be ill this morning that I don't even know about, that you would be pleased to bring healing to them and encouragement to them. I pray for Bill Groves and for Mona. I pray for Bill that he might be able to return home soon and enjoy his latter days at home with his wife uh, in comfort and blessing. Lord, we, we just thank you that you, you give us this avenue of prayer. We thank you that you give us this, uh, as Spurgeon called it, uh, prayer being the, the heart cries of the soul. We just thank you that we have that, that we can cast our cares on you, for you care for us. And we just pray for any of our unsaved loved ones that, that still are far from you, that you would work in them, save their souls, that they too might have the, the blessed assurance that in the last day they'll be there before you worshiping instead of hiding. Lord, we thank you for prayer. Thank you for the pattern prayer that we have been reciting week by week that reminds us of all the, the wonderful things of prayer and in this case we would maybe center on the fact that that prayer commonly called the lord's prayer calls upon us to wish 
your will to be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Lord, help us to consider what we say in these words. Help us to uh, truly apply ourselves to these words and be involved in these. And we thank you that we can recite that to you in the words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is uh, we're continuing in our study in 1 Timothy, and we're in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. So if you have a Bible, if you want to turn there, once again, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. And if you're able to do so, I'll ask you to stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Give ear to the word of God. It says, Paul writes, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, uh, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. This ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. The Bible tells us man does not live by bread alone, even though we pray for our daily bread, but we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of our God. So let's pray and ask God to teach us his word this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for your word. Thank you that you do not leave us in the dark to grope around and try to figure out who you are or to figure out the way of salvation through faith in Christ or even to figure out how you would have us to live out of gratitude for what you've done for us in saving us by your grace in Christ. We ask this morning that you would uh, feed us, as we know we don't live by bread alone. Feed us by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Give us understanding. Work in us by your spirit once again and give us eyes to see and ears to hear great things from your word. Speak, Lord, for your servants here, for it's in Christ's name that we ask all this. Amen. Well, in this brief passage at the end of 1 Timothy 1, uh, the Apostle Paul gives Timothy, which he calls again, I remember in chapter 1, verse 2, he called him his true child in the faith. Here again, he calls him his child. Well, he gives his child a charge to keep or a command to keep, uh, or more, he basically sets before him a charge and places it in his trust. And what was this charge? What charge did Paul command Timothy to keep as a pastor ordained unto gospel ministry? It was that he might, in verse 18, quote, wage the good warfare, or literally war the good warfare, or as the New American Standard puts it, fight the good fight. That's the charge he lays before Timothy. Even the language of this charge shows how serious a matter it was, and how fearful in some ways it really was uh, for Timothy and anybody else who is in ministry. This charge, I think, that Paul gives Timothy tells us a little something not the whole picture, but it tells us something about the nature, the real true nature of pastoral ministry in the church. The Bible, you might know, uses many different analogies or metaphors to describe ministry, uh, be it pastoring or eldering. It, it talks about in 1 Peter 5, 2, it describes it as shepherding the flock of God. So it's a literally a pastoral imagery, a shepherding imagery. Um, it uses sometimes, the Bible does, the imagery of construction or building a house. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10 talks about uh, the pastor and the elder as a builder. Uh, the Bible uses uh, imagery from agriculture to describe ministry as well, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, planting, watering, and tending a vineyard, God's vineyard. And uh, as our text does even this morning, even uses military imagery. 
uh, that, that of waging warfare, all these things in some way describe at least part of what it means to serve in the ministry. It's as if there's no single picture or analogy that's sufficient to describe everything that is involved in the task of a pastor or an elder. Now, you might be looking down at this brief text this morning and asking yourself, you know, what does this have to do with me? If I'm, if I'm not a pastor, you know, you're sitting there and you're thinking, I'm not a pastor, I'm not an elder, what does this have to do with me? Uh, especially if you don't think you're ever going to be ordained uh, to the work of ministry as a pastor or an elder. Well, I think there's a lot that you might uh, gain and should gain from this passage. The first thing is, who knows whether uh, what God might have in store for you in the future? Who knows if you're a boy or a young man, who knows whether or not the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, uh, the head of all things for his church, might one day call you to the ministry, either as an elder or pastor or even as a deacon. If that's the case, who knows? You know, Paul's words to Timothy here and throughout the pastoral epistles may one day have a very direct and personal application in your life. And so to learn them now will serve you well. And for many of us, though, that's not the case. For many of the people in the church, or many of our members, uh, those who confess the name of Christ and are members in Christ's uh, church, even if you may never be, for many reasons, an elder, a deacon, or a pastor, um, the, having a right view, a biblical view of the work of pastors and elders will serve you very well. It's good and beneficial for all of us who are in the church to have a right understanding of the work of which Christ has called his ministers for the sake of his flock. You know, we, to have a right expectation, you know, very often in life, not just in the church, not just in ministry and, and things like that, but in all things, our expectations kind of set the, the standard for good or for bad of what we want to have happen. And so if our expectations are false and they're not met, we might be unnecessarily troubled and grieved. But if our expectations are correct, and are biblical, that will serve us well in how we view these things. Now, in some way, your pastors and elders, or even the deacons to some degree, are, according to our text, are called, or even, to use a military analogy, drafted into a kind of warfare. <coughs> so the church, in some ways, is the, we, we call the church sometimes on earth, the church militant. You know, we, we are, in some ways, when you think of the Old Testament, the book of, of Joshua, the wilderness wanderings, Joshua, when, the, when he led the people of Israel into the land of Canaan, into the conquest of that land of promise, in a lot of ways, that's an analogy, an image of the church. And it's a, it's a military, in some ways, image. And so the church as a whole is called into warfare in some ways, uh, in a spiritual sense, and the pastors and elders of the church are called to that in a more direct manner. Now, just because... This particular warfare described in scripture is a spiritual one and is spiritual in nature. It doesn't make it any less serious, doesn't make it any less perilous. In some ways, really, if you have a right way of looking at things biblically, in a lot of ways, spiritual dangers are much more dangerous than earthly ones. And they're much, just as much to be uh, watched out for and taken care of for. Now, Paul here... <coughs> is reminding Timothy, whom he calls his child again in verse 18. Think about this imagery. Paul, I mean, Paul really thought of Timothy as his son in the faith. He, he may have had a lot to do with Timothy being converted to Christ, uh, and the fact that Paul had a genuine affection for him, who used, he used him and brought him along and kind of apprenticed him and taught him the ways uh, of a pastor and a church planter. And, but he's telling his son in the faith now, his child in the faith, that he's sending him forth to war. That's a, a scary thought for any parent when it comes to temporal things. Uh, no, no less so, I think, for Paul when he thought of Timothy. When he told him uh, in verse 3, when he reminds him that he told him to remain behind in Ephesus to set things in order, when he told him to stay behind, he was really sending him to the front lines in an ironic way. He was telling him he was sending him to war, and his task was not going to be an easy one, and that he would encounter enemies. He would encounter conflict. No one likes conflict. I don't. You probably don't. Uh, but sometimes it's, it's part of the nature of things. And it's, it's necessary to be willing to be involved in it. Now our brief passage this morning touches also, if you may, you may have noticed, on the subjects of ordination to ministry and excommunication 
from the church. So we're going to deal with those things at least briefly in our time, Lord willing, in our text this morning. Well, the first thing we see in our text today was that Timothy was given a charge to keep. Look at verse 18. He says, Paul writes, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may what? Mage, wage the good warfare. That was the trust that the charge that he was entrusted with. And this trust from Paul, his father in the faith, was entirely in line with what had been said of, of Timothy when he was ordained to gospel ministry. This was something that was entrusted to him by God. And so Timothy, like all ministers, should answer and would answer to God for how he carries it out. When it's a charge entrusted to you by God, whether through Paul or through someone else, uh, through your church leadership, it's, it's something, the implication is that he answers not just to Paul, he would answer to God for how he carried that charge out. Listen to the words of Hebrews 13.7. The writer of Hebrews says something similar there. Hebrews 13.17 says, Obey your leaders. He's talking about leaders in the church, the officers of the church. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, and here it is, as those who will have to give an account. Now, if you're uh, an elder in Christ's church, if you're a pastor, either a teaching elder or ruling elder, uh, that's a, a frightful thing to think about. It's a serious thing to be reminded of that you will give an account. I will give an account as a pastor for what I do as a pastor. Every elder will. And then he says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. In other words, your pastors, your elders have a very serious obligation and job. Don't make it harder. <laughs> it's already hard enough uh, in some ways. Don't make it harder because that's not going to help. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help them. And they already have a lot to do. Well, Paul says in, in the text there that he speaks of, quote, the prophecies previously made about Timothy. Now, this, I think, is, is clearly indicating uh, it's a reference to Timothy's ordination to ministry. I think that is what he is Referring to, Paul mentions this again later in the letter, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. Listen to what Paul writes there a few chapters from after this. He says, command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set uh, the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in faith, or in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching, and here it is. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So he says in chapter 4, he talks about the gift that he was given by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on him. That's, that's a picture of the church ordaining and setting someone apart for ministry. That was what was done. Uh, you know, we didn't have the Apostle Paul in our day, but even when I was ordained in this church, we had the elders come forward and lay hands. That's how we do things. That's how the Bible has always uh, taught it to be done. So when Timothy was set apart or ordained to public ministry of the gospel, the elders laid their hands upon him, and prophecy of some kind was spoken of or spoken over him. Perhaps Timothy was even especially gifted beyond his peers by the Holy Spirit in some way. But think about this. Despite all that, despite how gifted Timothy was by the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God and Jesus Christ, that did not make diligence and hard work and practice and self-introspection and watch and persistence unnecessary, did it? All those giftings, as important as they are, didn't mean that it wasn't hard work, didn't mean that Timothy did not have to apply himself diligently to these things. Notice that ordination in our text and the scripture throughout, ordination is from God himself. Who ordained Timothy and every other pastor and elder since? Who is the one ultimately who ordains them to ministry? Was it the council of elders? Is it men? Is it the church itself? Strictly speaking, no. Ordination is from God himself. 
but it always comes through the church. And those two things must not be separated or divorced. Those things must go together. No man may appoint himself to ministry. The Apostle Paul goes to great lengths in his epistles to make sure that we understand that he did not call himself to ministry. He says it in the first verse of this letter. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by what? By command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. The only reason Paul himself was an apostle, no less, was the command of God and of Jesus Christ. And so ordination is from God himself, always and only, and it always comes through the church. No man may appoint himself to ministry. Self-appointed ministers are not true servants of Christ at all. If the Lord Jesus calls a man to the ministry of the gospel, it will be through his church that he does it. Even seminaries. Some people think seminaries make someone a pastor. They don't. They will, good ones will tell you they don't. Seminaries do not ordain. Churches do. The elders of the church do that. God uses the church to set men apart for ministry. Here in our text, Paul tells Timothy that the good warfare that he was called to serve in was entirely in line with what was said of him and, and to him at his ordination. And so Timothy Paul is telling him in some ways to bring this back to mind. Remember, remember what was said of you at your ordination. Remember the prophecies that were, that were spoken of and over you to encourage him in the work. Timothy was to call those things to his mind. When the going got tough, he was to be strengthened and encouraged by it. Having a solid assurance that you really have been called by God and set apart for ministry goes a long way when the going gets rough in the ministry as it often tends to do. And so Paul, at least twice in this letter, brings Timothy's mind back to that very thing, to encourage him, to assure him in the work. Now you might know that warfare is not just an analogy of the work of ministry in the gospel, but it's also an analogy of the Christian life for all believers in Jesus Christ. Think about Ephesians chapter 6. Almost the whole chapter deals with this, but in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13, the Apostle Paul writes to the whole church at Ephesus, and he says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, here he says it again, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. So if you're a member of a church, if you're a Christian right now, and you're listening to this sermon, and you're saying, well, whew, I'm glad I'm not a pastor. I'm glad I'm not an elder. Guess what? I got bad news for you. I have good news and bad news, and they're both the same news. You're still in the fight, too. The entire church on this earth is the church militant. When you're in heaven with the Lord, when Christ comes or calls, then you'll be with the church triumphant, and you'll be no longer in the fight, and you can rest easy from your labors and from the fight. But this warfare, this spiritual warfare, is not just for your pastors and elders. It's all of us. We're all in this fight together. Well, the second thing we see in our text, besides that charge that Paul gives to Timothy, the second thing we see here in our text, and it's something he's already said before, in, the, in this chapter, is the vital importance of faith and a good conscience. The vital importance of faith and a good conscience. Paul tells Timothy and us through him uh, how this good warfare was to be waged. It must be fought, what does he say in verse 19? It must be fought, quote, holding faith and a good conscience. That doesn't sound like the weapons of warfare that we normally would think of, but that's what Paul is saying. This is how you are to conduct yourself in this warfare. Faith. What, is, what does Paul mean when he says faith? Faith, I think, here has not to do just with Timothy's own personal faith in Christ, although it's involved in that. I think faith here has to do with holding to the true doctrine of the Christian faith. Timothy had to hold on to that to stay true to it, but he also needed to have a good conscience. It wasn't one or the other. It had to be both. So what's he, this is what he's talking about when he says that Timothy... Uh, was, was his life and his doctrine were both important. It wasn't just what he believed and what he taught. It was also how he lived. 
before God, according to that very doctrine. Both things had to go together. That's why he says in 1 Timothy 4.16, which we read a little earlier ago, he says, 1 Timothy 4.16, he tells Timothy, keep a close watch on two things, on yourself, and notice that comes first. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, not one or the other, not just the teaching, not just his walk. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Those are pretty strong words. He's not saying that Timothy would be a savior. He's saying that by, by maintaining the gospel ministry by faith and a good conscience, you will be a faithful minister of the gospel and sinners will be saved by faith in Christ. John Stott writes the following. He says, that thus, belief and behavior, conviction and conscience, the intellectual and the moral are closely linked. This is because God's truth contains ethical demands. We like, we like to keep things neat and tidy and divide things up, and, and yet there's, there are ethical demands in all of God's word. Doctrine implies duty and vice versa. This is what Paul was mentioning back in 1 Timothy 1.5, back earlier in the chapter, when he told Timothy that there was the aim, the purpose or the aim of his instruction to Timothy was that he might, might, quote, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. And what was the aim of that charge? Timothy was to stay behind in Ephesus. He was, he was to charge people, certain people, that he would know who they were, not to teach any different doctrine. And here's the aim of it. He says, love that issues, excuse me, love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. It's a theme that comes up again and again in, in this letter. He also reminds Timothy there that certain persons had, quote, swerved from these things, and as a result, what had happened? They had wandered away. When you swerve away, you know, it's a picture. If you, they didn't have cars back then, obviously, but you think of someone driving, and all of a sudden, they veer off violently. That's the picture he's giving here. They swerved away from faith and a good conscience, and what was the result? They wandered away from the faith. They wandered away from the Christian faith. So false teaching and false living often go together. Which one is the chicken and which one is the egg? That's hard to tell. It's not always easy to tell which one comes first. Sometimes, sometimes, frankly, it's a person's unrepented of desires and sins that lead to swerving from the truth and teaching a different doctrine, heterodoxy or heresy. Other times, it's false doctrine that leads a person to live in a way that contradicts the truth of the gospel. It works both ways, and so both are important. I have personally seen in recent years instances of this very kind of thing, and you probably have too if you've paid attention to what goes on in the church all over the, uh, the land. The pastors and teachers of God's word who were for a time, maybe for a long time, faithful uh, to the scriptures, suddenly changed their tune on various sins. Very often it's sexual sins of some kind. They change their tune on those things, and then they begin to teach things contrary to the Word of God. And what happens next? It's sadly very predictable and at times. Before long, it comes to light that they are eventually themselves engaged in that very immorality. In other words, they had a desire for that thing already, and so somehow they look for loopholes. They come up with loopholes in the Scripture. They start teaching things to make way for their sins. Sometimes it goes the other way as, as well. And this last thing that Paul brings up in our text is he mentions not just the importance of faith and good conscience, but he, he, what's the result of, of denying those things or rejecting those things? It's shipwreck concerning the faith. You know, these warnings that Paul gives Timothy, he tells us in these last couple verses, these weren't hypotheticals. He wasn't saying, this will never happen, but you better watch out for it just in case. He gives him two examples that Timothy would have known about. Look at verses 19 to 20, where he gives two well-known examples to Timothy of this very thing. He says, by rejecting this, that is faith with a good conscience, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So Paul kind of mixes his military metaphors here, doesn't he? He talks about soldiers, a good warfare, and now he talks about sailors in a sense. He says that by...
deliberately casting off faith in a good conscience, some have made a shipwreck of their faith. Now, this was to be taken as a warning and an encouragement to Timothy, wasn't it? And we should take note of the sad example of those who have likewise made shipwreck concerning the faith. You know, we, we today, like Timothy in his day, also need to watch our lives and doctrine closely. Both things together, both things are equally important. And Paul does something here in our text, as you've probably noticed, uh, that, that might, go against, might go against some of our delicate sensibilities in our day. He does something that no one likes to do today, that... People shun, people get offended when you do this, but he names names. And he didn't just name names, he named names that Timothy would know firsthand. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any difference for him. He named names. And we too should take note of that, of that, the set example of those who have done that. He names names precisely because Timothy knew of these men. He knew, probably knew them personally, probably had personal interactions and dealings with them. He mentions Hymenaeus, first of all, who he mentions later on in the very next book. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 to 19, this is what he writes. 2 Timothy 2, 16 to 19, Paul says to Timothy again, But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead, in, it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them, here it is, among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, there's that phrase again, swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So what, what false doctrines did Hymenaeus teach? We don't know the full picture. What we do know, according to Paul here, is that his teaching and influence were first, they were leading people into more and more ungodliness and sin. The effect of his doctrine, the fruits of his teaching were sinful. And the second thing is we know that he taught in some way, verse 18, that the resurrection has already happened. Now that may seem like a strange thing, but that's not as uncommon as you might think. Perhaps he taught that the resurrection itself was an invisible spiritual reality. Think about, in our own day, the Jehovah's Witnesses. What do they teach about the return of Christ, which precedes the, second, the, uh, the, re the resurrection and the judgment? The Jehovah's Witnesses taught and teach uh, that the second coming of Christ happened secretly and invisibly in 1914. Remember, the, the founder of that cult was uh, fond of setting dates, as many still seem to be fond of doing it. They set dates even though Jesus tells us no man knows the day or the hour. Well, some people just aren't satisfied with that. They don't want to have such limitations and say, well, I know the secret, so you better follow me. They set dates, then what happens? Jesus didn't come. They set the date. They revised the date. Prophets don't revise things. They revised the date. Jesus didn't come again. So what happens? They said, okay, 1914, and he didn't come. What happened? Well, he came. You just couldn't see it. It was invisible. It was secret. It was spiritual in nature. And so think about what that implies in some way that implies the judgment is already passed. The resurrection is already passed. Well, that's what in some way Hymenaeus himself taught. Now, if the resurrection has already passed and the judgment has already passed, you can kind of imagine how that might tend towards immorality of all kinds. It doesn't matter what you do in the body because it's all spiritual. It's a kind of a Gnostic kind of, of thought where the spiritual is important and the physical doesn't matter. Well, the scripture doesn't talk that way. The Bible doesn't teach that. Anyway, whatever the case was, he was, he was causing God's name to be blasphemed. Not only by his doctrine, but by the fruits of that doctrine, by leading God's people into sin and ungodliness. The glory of God's name was at stake. When you think of false teaching, false doctrine, that is one of the first things, maybe the first thing that we should be mindful of is the glory of God and that God's name might, be, might not be blasphemed by such things. And so what did Paul do in the case of these two men that he names to Timothy here? They were excommunicated from the church. In verse 20, he says, he handed them over to Satan. That's a pretty strong way to say it. They were formerly, formerly cast out of the church by excommunication. Now this is done, you know, we talk about this, but 
This is done in the cases of scandalous public sins that are unrepented of, as well as for false doctrine that is unrepented of. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, Paul writes this. He says to the Corinthian church, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? And this is what he says. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. They were very, you know, our age is very tolerant. We love the word tolerant. Well, they were too tolerant. And Paul says they were bringing disrepute upon the gospel. And so they were to remove this person from among them. He says, for though absent in body, Paul wasn't there in person yet. Although absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, who's present in church discipline? The Lord Jesus Christ is, and he is active in it. With the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. It's pretty harsh sounding words. But it was for his good and for the good of the church. To be cast out of the church is in some sense to be cast out of the protection of the Lord that he grants within his church. For a professing Christian to be cast out of the church, even for a time, is it's the final step in church discipline. After all other efforts have been exhausted to no effect without repentance on the part of the person. That's that it's the last straw, so to speak, the last desperate thing. And so in regard to both these things, I would say, you know, if you're a pastor, whether it be myself or someone else, whether your elders, if they are unwilling to do this, if they're unwilling to name names when need be, to, to charge people not to teach false doctrine, and when it comes to it, if they're unwilling to cast someone out who is disrupting the unity and health of the church, um, you need a new pastor. You need, you need new elders. If they're, if they're not willing to do that, uh, they are not a true servant of Christ, and they are not waging the good warfare. It's not pleasant. No one likes to do it. If, if you have a pastor on the other side of the coin that seems to delight in such a thing, you might need a new pastor too. If you enjoy church discipline, there's something wrong with you. If you avoid it altogether, there's something wrong with you. There's, it's got to be a balance somewhere in the middle, but it's necessary to do. Um, to be cast out of the church should be a fearful thing for any professing Christian. And yet how many in our day, I can't help but think of it as, uh, as ironic and sad, how many in the church today, notwithstanding our own present circumstance where we can't gather, how many professing Christians today effectively cast themselves out by not joining a church and refusing to attend public worship? I don't think they understand what they're doing. They may or may not even be believers, but they don't understand. They're, they're essentially casting themselves out of the protection that God gives, that Christ gives in defending his church from within the church. They are, in some sense, uh, delivering themselves over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. They are putting themselves in harm's way. It's like, it's kind of like, you know, you think of a, a sheep, a group of sheep, and one wanders off. The one that wanders off is the one that gets picked off. It's not a safe thing to do. Now, Jesus will, he knows those who are his, and he will bring them back and seek them out. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not a healthy or good thing to be outside of, of the church. Now notice this was not to be done in a, such a way as to presume they wouldn't ever be brought back to repentance. The goal of church discipline, remember, that you might know that in the Reformation, they often talked about the three marks of the true church. Here's a history lesson. The three marks of the true church is the, the faithful preaching of the word of God, the, the right administration of the sacraments, and the third one is the faithful exercise of church discipline. And so by those marks, to, fa to fail to have any of those three, we would mean that in some sense it's not even a true church. So discipline is important. But what's the goal of church discipline? Not just excommunication, but all church discipline of any kind. What is the goal of it? The goal is, is the purity of the church, but not just that. The goal is, by the grace of God, the hope of restoring the sinner to repentance. The goal isn't to cast someone out. That may be the result. That's not the goal of even that. The goal is to, by God's grace, see them renewed to repentance. 
It's a wake-up call. It's meant to be a wake-up call. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, you might know that in that chapter, Paul tells the Corinthian church to restore that brother that he told to send, remember he told before to cast them out, to deliver that man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That man evidently repented, but they weren't, you know, before they were too tolerant. Now they weren't letting him back in. And what did Paul tell them to do? He told them to restore, he says in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 2, to forgive and comfort him to not be too severe towards him. They were, the whole goal was to restore the man by getting him to repent. And so the, the goals, the purposes of church discipline is the glory of God, first and foremost, the purity and health of the church, secondly and last, uh, but not least, Lord willing, the repentance uh, and the restoration of the sinner. That's the point. So the point should never be punitive to just get rid of them. Oh, now we're done with this person. The point should be to have them repent. And when they do repent, we should welcome them back with open arms. That's the way it is supposed to be. But that doesn't sound very easy, does it? That's not a very simple, easy-sounding picture. That's why, probably why Paul likened this to, good, to waging a good warfare. It wasn't something that was easy. You know, if it was easy, anybody would do it. He's saying, Timothy, this is going to be hard. And you need to be faithful in doing these things. Now, may the Lord Jesus, who is the head of the church, of all things for the church may he grant that all of us especially our pastors and elders might be good soldiers of jesus christ that we might be willing to endure hardship and fight the good fight of faith holding fast to faith in a good conscience and charging others not to teach false doctrine to christ's sheep that is not in accordance with the gospel and godliness in jesus christ amen let's let's pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you also uh, for the instructions, the clear instructions you give us uh, for how things are to be done in your church, for how our elders and deacons and pastors are to, be, uh, are to serve in this good warfare, how we are to conduct ourselves in the church, even when it comes to doctrine and discipline and life. Lord, we thank you for these things, and we ask that you would bless your, your pastors and elders and deacons. We pray that you would uh, give us all wisdom and grace and courage to do what needs to be done in your church, that we pray that you would guard us from false teaching and from heresy, from false living as well, that you would glorify your name in this church and many others, that uh, we would be glorifying to you in how we live, that we would live in such a way that adorns the gospel, that is fitting with the gospel of your grace in Jesus Christ, to which you have called us to eternal life. And Lord, we ask that there's anybody out there this morning listening uh, here even now that, that does not yet know you and is still in their sins that you would grant them repentance and faith in Christ show them their sins show them their desperate need for Jesus Christ and lead them to repentance from their sins that they might turn from their sin and turn back to you through faith in Jesus they might stand in him and be clothed as we've heard before in the righteousness of Christ alone that they might be able in him alone to stand on that great day and Lord we even ask if there's anybody out there listening who is, uh, that we might not even know, but who is under the discipline of their elders who have been cast out of your church for hardness of heart and a failure to repent. We pray that you might stir them up even now, that they might turn from their sin and return to your church humbly and in repentance and that their church might restore them uh, to the fellowship of, of your church, that it might be a cause of great rejoicing and joy and comfort for all and that the glory of Christ might be made evident more and more even in that. For we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, our final hymn this morning is a familiar one, I'm sure, to many of you. It's number 446 in the Trinity Psalter hymnal. 446. It's Be Thou My Vision. And I'll invite you to stand for our final hymn. Thank you. 
from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.